Hi, Vicki Wu with Vicki Wu Marketing. And today I'm going to talk about some of these new social media platforms that you may have heard of, like MeWe, Ello, Telegram, Parler, and a few others. And I'm going to talk about whether or not I recommend these platforms to my clients for part of their marketing strategy. This is Vicki Wu, and as always, we're talking about the best tips for marketing your small business. Be sure to subscribe to our channel to be notified of the latest updates. Before we get into which platform I think your business should be on and why, I want to talk about the evolution of the existing platforms, why people keep using them, how the new platforms are different, and where your business needs to be. Let's delve into the evolution of the existing platforms and why they've had to change along the way. I am an early adopter of all platforms because as soon as I hear about one, it starts getting any buzz, I go check it out because I need to be able to inform my clients, you, as to whether or not it's a good, solid marketing strategy or it, maybe it's not now, but it may be in the future. I need to be on top of that, so I'm an early adopter. My Facebook account goes back to 2006, and there's been some other social media platforms that I've even been on longer. I've seen how they started. I've seen how they've evolved over time. I see how they're being used now, and along the way, all those best practices, that's what I bring into my work. These existing platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, that's kind of the main three I'm going to talk about throughout this. They've been around a long time, and we all know they've evolved. Every time there's an algorithm update, it, you know, it kind of drives you crazy. You got to do things a little bit differently for a bit. They started off pretty much in the same spot where these new ones are starting now. So that's something you need to understand. It doesn't mean the new ones are going to end up in the same place because, like I said, Facebook, I've been on the platform 14 years. It started 15 years ago. That's a long time. If you gave birth to a baby now, they'd be a teenager well into those really annoying teenage years in 15 years. It's kind of where we see the social media platforms, right? <laughs> Realistically, they kind of started in the same place. Over time, they grew. More users started coming on. More and different types of content were shared. Think back, Twitter used to be all you could do was 140 characters of text. Nothing else, no images, no video. Facebook was pretty similar, even though they had those image and video capabilities a little bit sooner. Text takes little room, and we're talking room on their computer servers that they're having to purchase and pay for using the storage space, just like you have in a computer. And also for the bandwidth, for people to access the server. Kind of think about it like your Wi-Fi, but it's a little bit different on a server. So they're having to pay those costs. And if you know anything about your computer, if you store a text document, like a notepad document or a Word document even, it's gonna take up a lot less space on your computer than storing an image. And even an image is gonna take up a lot less space than storing audio and video. Now imagine if everybody in your house, if you have more than one person, 10 people in your house and they're all using the same computer, it starts getting bogged down and you've got to go buy a couple more computers. That's kind of similar, vaguely similar to how businesses that offer software as a service, how they have to manage, they have to buy more and more server space to be able to keep up with increasing demand that costs money. It's hardware they have to buy, not including the software that they're having to code and maintain, money that they're having to spend. And then as more and more people are on the platform and their data usage and everything is increasing and those costs are increasing, it also takes more personnel and those employees also cost more and more money. Now, that's to say that over time, these platforms can start off free. It can be, you know, somebody's hobby on the side and you can start it and run it and it doesn't cost you a lot, works good. You may be able to make some money off of it, but for the most part, you may not need to. I myself have had a 
website with a chat feature and I hosted the chat feature. It was for a bunch of other people who wanted to use it. It cost nearly nothing. But at some point, if that needed to grow, it would have started costing me money. I would have had to put it on its own server. That would have cost me money. And at that point, I would have kind of two main choices. There's a lot of other nuances we won't get into. But the main choices would be either charge the person that's accessing it, the user, or offer advertising. As these platforms grow, as more people use them, it's standard that you have to have a way to generate money and most of the platforms find out that rather than charge a user membership fee, it's easier to charge for advertising fees. And the advertisers then kind of love it because they have a large platform of audience. As the platform grows and the advertisers start coming on, they have needs and expectations as to the software's capabilities. So you have to start working with that. And then something that you find out because Facebook and Twitter, and I know this from experience because I was there at the beginning, they didn't moderate your content at all. They didn't have fact checkers. They might have had an abuse email. So if somebody was like really abusive threatening you, you'd email, you know, abuse at whatever and report it and they'd have people checking. But the sheer volume of people has caused the need for content moderation. And even on that chat forum that I had years and years ago, that's the exact same thing we saw. When it was 50 or 100 people that just liked to chat with each other and keep in contact, this is before Facebook, so there weren't as many options of keeping in contact with people that are further away other than phone. But this was a little bit more, you know, group interactive. And when we had that smaller group, we didn't even need to moderate because everybody knew how to behave, right? They knew not to, you know, cast each other out, not to threaten each other, whatever it was. We all knew the expectations and we set some very loose rules, but we didn't have to worry about it because we all knew each other. We all knew the expectations we each had with each other. As it started to grow, the new people who came on might not know those expectations. And then you get even more people and it gets further and further removed from the original, you know, set of guidelines that we all just inherently understood. And that's when you have to start enacting policies and at some point kind of restricting people. What happens is a couple of things. If you've ever studied psychology at all, which of course I've done for marketing and advertising, you've learned about mob mentality and how there can be a mob of a hundred people watching something take place. Say a little old lady's getting her purse stolen on the street and there can be a hundred people around just standing watching and until one of them does something, the other ones won't act. So, kind of like going to the buffet line when you're at a party and the buffet line opens and nobody will go walk over. The food's nice and piping hot. You know, it's the best time to go get food, but everybody's kind of like, well, I don't want to go first. Is it really time? I'm not sure. Maybe we're supposed to wait and like listen to a band or whatever. And then as soon as the first one goes over there, everybody else feels comfortable and goes and starts getting their food. Same concept here, but it can go one of two ways. The little old lady's getting her purse stolen. If somebody steps forward and stops that... If someone steps forward and says, this isn't right, you shouldn't do it, all of the other people then will start doing that same thing. And that's a positive. You're keeping something bad from happening. The opposite can also happen, and this is what we see on social media because of the anonymity attached to it. Whenever you can be behind a screen name, it changes how people behave. So in that mob mentality, they started stealing other people's purses on the purse snatcher it's also more likely that the group would tend to go that direction and do the same. You actually see that mentality happening in some of these riot situations that happen. That mob mentality can go either way. It can go towards a positive or towards a negative. So what we saw on the chat forum and what has happened to these existing social media platforms over time is that you get people who misbehave. They don't know the rules or expectations, but they don't care about them. 
or they're just there being a troll, whatever it is, they start to misbehave. And at that time, you have to have a way to stop the behavior. And that's where the feeling of censorship that I've heard a lot of talk about lately comes in because the platform in conjunction with the users, depending upon how large it gets, has to decide what content is appropriate and what isn't. And when it isn't, they have to decide what to do about it. Do you just keep it from being seen? Do you kick the person off? Do you block their IP address so they can't come back? We saw that evolve in that chat forum that I had hosted long ago, where the more and more people come on, you start getting some of those bad actors, people trolling. You know, trolls are just there to stir up crap. It's not healthy on any platform. So you have to start doing something. That's what Places like Facebook, Twitter, and these other platforms have experienced as well. The more people who come on, you're going to have more of the bad actors. One bad actor, like we said with the mob mentality, starts stirring up others. And at some point, they have to enact some level of curating, censoring, whatever you want to call it, of not allowing certain types of content to be shared. There's probably better ways it could be done. But like we've talked about how people evolve, we're about 15 years into Facebook and Twitter. Adolescent teenage years, they're still growing through some growing pains of trying to figure out that full freedom that you get when you're 18 and the full guidance that you have when you're younger. And where is the right place in between those for a platform like a social media platform to land? That Evolution concept is going to be important for what I talk about in a moment, but let's ask, you know, why is Facebook still around? That's the one that I see people complain about the most often because it's very personal. We share photos, we share videos, we share stories, we connect with family, with friends, and then with other people as well. So it really has more of that kind of personal or homey feel. I don't feel the same way about that platform as I do about Twitter, about LinkedIn, some of these others, YouTube. They're all very different. If you think through this as well, why you're using it and how you interact on it changes based upon the platform. People have been complaining about Facebook for a long time, but lately it's with some censorship issues. So we ask, you know, how is it still around? You know why? Because that's where your people are. That's why people keep coming back to the platform. They may decide they've had enough and leave and join one of these other newer ones, but they come back to Facebook because everybody's there. Aunt Betsy now has a Facebook, and your second cousin once removed you've connected to on Facebook, and that person that you sort of half knew and, you know, half friend, half acquaintance in high school, the only place you interact with them is on Facebook, and you want to keep these relationships and that interaction going and that's why people keep coming back to Facebook because these other platforms don't have the same use level yet not to say that they won't but all the people are on these other existing ones because they've been around so long that being said one of the biggest selling points of these newer platforms right now some of them have been around a little bit longer than others but is that they say that they don't have censorship that it's you know, free to say whatever you want, yet they do censor, and we'll talk about that in a bit. One of the things I want you to keep in mind, that if the platform is free, you're the product. Like I said, they have to have money coming in the door somehow, and even though they may not be having advertisers yet, and they may not be selling your data to anyone yet, to keep the platform moving forward, somebody has to be paying for it, and if they keep offering it to you for free, that means you're going to be the product. If you followed Edward Snowden at all, and I bring it up because of the whole censorship piece, he basically said social media is nothing but surveillance in disguise. That these acronym agencies are watching social media. And you know what? It's probably true. I don't have any way of knowing, but... If I'm in one of those positions, if I'm an FBI agent chasing a bad guy, yeah, I'm going all over social media. And you know what? 
If he's on one of those new platforms, I'm going on that platform too. So it's not that this kind of surveillance, if it's happening, it's not that it's limited to like Facebook and Twitter, but by gosh, any platform that's open and that you're going to be on and that people can see the stuff, if you're a bad guy, they're following you everywhere. That's just how it is. If they can sign up for your email newsletter, they're going to do that too. It's just part of it. So that alone wouldn't keep me from leaving one platform and going to another because if I'm a bad guy doing bad stuff and the FBI is after me, they're going to follow me to the other one anyway. Then we talk about censorship. And you know, there's some platforms out there that actually don't censor at all. It's not the ones we're going to be talking about. Something like 8chan, which has now, it's now defunct because they literally let anyone do and say anything they wanted. There was child pornography on there. There was people posting their manifestos of how they were going to go kill a bunch of people. It was uncensored. That's what you're talking about when you talk uncensored, is that even that type of thing is going to be allowed to happen. 8chan's no longer around because the servers hosting it weren't okay with that type of content being hosted on their server. So they actually shut the site down, even though the creator of 8chan wasn't doing any censoring himself. An interesting tidbit they've traced back that the guy who started that piece of trash website, let me tell you, if you've never experienced it, you don't want to, and it's never anything you would want to find your kids on accidentally when they're surfing the internet. It was that bad. But the guy who started that, they've traced IP addresses and some other things. You can go read all about it. I'm not going to explain what all they did. But they find, found out that he is actually Q, who is now being followed by all these people calling themselves QAnon. So keep that in mind if you are following QAnon information, who you're getting it from. That's all I have to say. So now let's talk about a few of these newer platforms that you may not have heard of. Most of these I have already signed up for and been testing out a bit to be able to recommend them or not to my clients based upon their needs. And then there's a couple of them that I haven't, but I researched them for you anyway. So the first one we're going to talk about is Parlor because that's the one that's been having the most growth recently. And one of the reasons why is that they say they have no censorship, that they are true freedom of speech. Think of it like a new version of Twitter that promises you no censorship and freedom of speech. They rely on advertising, but it's a slightly different form of advertising than Twitter or Facebook uses. But remember, if you're not paying, you're the product and it applies to all of these other sites that don't charge you a membership fee. That's just how it is. They don't use the same kind of annoying algorithm that Facebook and Twitter and those have developed. And there's reasons why they develop that. When you grow too far, you have to have something in place to control the massive flow of data. So at some point, if it grows a certain size, there's going to have to be some of these kinds of algorithms put into it because the amount of data growth is going to require a different function than they have right now. Also, they say that they have, you know, free speech and they don't censor, but they have already had to censor people. Why? That whole mob mentality thing we talked about. People start feeling free to literally post whatever they want, and they were posting things like pornography, and they were posting obscenities repeatedly geared towards one person, that kind of like cyberbullying. And so they've already had to crack down and start censoring posts. They did it real lightly back this summer by simply saying that they had some rules now. But rules mean that if you don't follow the rules, you're going to get your account shut off. You're going to get your post removed. You're going to get your comments removed. So even this newer platform, they've been around for several years, that is expressing that they're the free speech alternative with no censorship, they're having to censor because us humans, when we get a mob of us together, we don't know how to behave. There's also a couple questionable things in their terms of service. Everybody's terms of service are full of legalese, and you try to read through them and try to understand it, and you're not a lawyer, so who knows what we're really signing, right? 
but in their case, there was one thing that I questioned was that they're a, they can update their terms of service at any time. And by continuing to use a platform like that, you're agreeing to the new terms, whatever they are. But in their case, they say that they don't have to notify you when they update those terms. So now you're being held to a new standard and you don't even know what it is. So keep that in mind. Most of them say, we will notify you through one of these, you know, methods, email or a notice on the site, whatever it may be. Parlor's terms, unless they have changed them since the last time I reviewed them about last week, say that they're not required to notify you when they make an update and you're just supposed to know and you're supposed to make sure you're following the new terms of service. There's also a term, I think it's number 14. Quite a few people have brought this one up if you just do a little bit of research. This one basically says that you agree to defend Parler and its, you know, officers, employees, whatever, against any claims. In layman's term, a claim is a lawsuit. And so you're agreeing to defend them in a lawsuit. How that would actually work, I don't know. Like, are they going to split the cost along all the members? Do they have my credit card info so that they can just take it? What does that look like? The bigger issue was that they have a term in there, unless they've changed it very recently, unless they've changed it very recently, if you cause them to have some kind of damage, so for example, if a post you share causes someone to sue them and win and they have to pay somebody, that you're responsible for all of those damages, all of their legal fees, and all of that. So... That's kind of the difference between what's going on with Twitter and Facebook and the terms you agreed to on Parler. Twitter and Facebook don't have that in their terms of service, that you're going to be the one paying if they get sued because of your post. They are in a position where legally they have to take down the really offensive stuff and not allow it on the platform. Parler tells you you can post whatever you want, but, because there's always a but, if they get sued because of what you post, so for example, you post some of that child pornography or manifesto, like we talked about the other site was allowing, if they get sued because of that and they lose the lawsuit and they have to pay money, you're the one that they're going to come after to get their money. I don't think they do a good enough job sharing that because, you know, we talked about the mob mentality and how it can go really wrong. But I think the people on Parler, if they knew they were legally liable for a lot of money based upon what they post, I think they'd be censoring themselves. And kind of that's what it comes down to. If we're relying upon individuals to self-censor, the company is pulling themselves out of the equation as they should. So you need to be aware of that. I'm not saying it's bad or good. I'm just telling you the difference between how Twitter and Facebook, for example, are having to censor some of that information. So that's one of the big differences. They will have growing pains and what they look like now probably won't be the same as what they look like in five years. That's just part of it. We're just gonna have to kind of see where it goes. Let's talk about a few others. Me, we, it's more like a chat app. They promote themselves as, as having no ads, no spyware, and no political bias. Again, at some point, they have to be making money somewhere when it grows big enough that they can't do it for free anymore. Either you're going to pay or there's going to be ads or some other way. Membership, optional membership, something will change at that point. So it'll be interesting to see how it evolves. Ello is a little bit more like Pinterest. It's really great for creators, creative people like me with my artwork. That's why I first jumped on Ello. They say they don't sell your data and there's no ads. Again, at some point, there's going to be something. It's just figuring out. It's just figuring out how they're going to pay for it when it gets to the point where there's too much growth. Telegram is kind of like an alternative to WhatsApp. And it's one of the ones that I actively use to an extent. One of the great things, you know, it's like WhatsApp and WhatsApp is a lot like SMS messaging. 
But it's great because on Telegram, if, if you have people who can code, you can make all these like automations. And they say it's encrypted, but there's no end-to-end -end encryption. And because of the way their encryption goes, you have to remember that things are stored forever. So even if you delete it, it's on their servers forever. But for me in my work, it's probably out of this list I'm giving you the most used followed by LO just because of what I do. So a few more that you may not have heard so much about that are kind of up and coming. Diaspora has pods kind of like servers. Kind of like if you each have your own server and that's your own pod. Vero is a subscription-based one. So again, we talked about how the company has to make money. It's either ads or it's subscriptions. And in Vero's case, it's subscription you're going to pay for using the platform. BitChute is a video hosting, a little bit more like YouTube, but they keep their costs down because they use your bandwidth. I haven't explored how exactly how that works but all i know is that our bandwidth in our house we don't need anything else going in on it and that's why i didn't explore it because with you know with covid and everybody's working from home we're already really struggling for our bandwidth to maintain what we need to do for work we don't need to add another piece to it steam it is a site where kind of you get paid to blog they use blockchain and the payment is through a Bitcoin, the Steam Bitcoin, from what I remember. So that's where the money piece is coming from. Like we said, somebody's got to pay. So if you're getting paid, they're taking a percentage of that. So that's how they're making their money. Mines is kind of similar to that. They pay you in cryptocurrency, very similar. And you can say you post content and you can earn cryptocurrency based on that content and then you can use that cryptocurrency to get more views on your content and signal signals another one that i've actually tested and and used more than once at this point it is one-to-one -one and group messaging kind of like sms and it's a little bit different because it's actually a nonprofit. now a nonprofit doesn't mean that they can't sell ads or they can't charge you it just means that instead of all of the profit going directly into the CEO's pocket, they use that money to turn around and reinvest in the platform. So that's how they're a little bit different. So where do I expect all these platforms to end up? Really, in some shape or form, the same place the existing ones are. Because of all those reasons we talked about why Facebook and Twitter have had to change and pivot and start charging and start fact checking and censoring content all of those same reasons with people more and more people growing onto the platform will cause these smaller platforms to make massive changes over time may not be tomorrow that they make those changes and it may only be a change here and a change there but they're going to evolve and quite frankly in five ten years our environment is going to look so drastically different that I couldn't even be begin to tell you what their evolution may end up looking like. But if you take into account the reasoning why the other ones have had to change over time, those same factors will play into it as well. It'll actually be interesting to see where all of these platforms, you know, the existing ones, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and these newer ones, where they all end up down the road. Now the burning question, which platform should your business be on? There's no question you can use any platform you want for yourself, your personal posting, whichever ones make you the most comfortable, we're all in, you know, do it. But your business needs to use a different set of criteria. Even if you are your business, you're a personal service individual or you've got some team, it doesn't matter. If it's your name on your business, your personal life still has to have that separation from your business persona. Not everyone's going to agree with that, but I've seen it over and over and over again. You do need to brand your business persona separately from what you do for all of your personal life. There's 
places where they cross over a bit and there's places where it's not appropriate. That said, while you can be on any platform for yourself, for your business, you need to be where your customers are. And that likely isn't yet on these other platforms. Why? Just because of the sheer quantity. Yeah, these other platforms are growing, but the existing ones still have a greater quantity of your client on them. Why businesses are on the big social media sites is because that's where the most people are and therefore also the most prospective customers. Keep in mind, social media needs to always be about being social. And these other ones that aren't overtaken yet with businesses that do social media marketing poorly by just spamming, it's probably going to happen just like it has everywhere else. But try to keep it social. Make sure that your presence is where your customers are. That's the low-hanging fruit that you need to be able to tap into and interact with. So my best advice, which platform do you need to be on? It's the one that your customers are on. As always, if you have any marketing questions, you can drop your question down below or visit our website, vickywoo.marketing. And in the bottom right corner, there's a chat bubble icon. You can ask your question there and we'll answer you directly or we may even use your question on an upcoming episode.